with this with this session, I wanted to show you um, some other interesting things, which were configurations, um, dynamic springs, because a lot of our devices are kind of like actuating. They do some kind of motion uh, to deploy. And so I wanted to show you uh, a simple way to, to animate that kind of thing. Um, the springs are usually, that was one of the mo most complicated things I've learned on SOLIDWORKS was just figuring that out. So that's the kind of information I wanted to share because I don't want anyone else to struggle with that <laughs> if they if they feel like they need to, to animate that in some way. Um, configurations are pretty useful as well. So uh, that's what I'll, I'll show you first. So I'm just in a, a basic part right here. I'm going to Let's see, what can I, I'll just sketch something quick. So um, we'll do a cylinder with a, a hole in the middle. And so um, it becomes more important when you do configurations to add names to your dimensions so that you can uh, figure out what they are later because they'll be in a list and you won't really know. It's just going to say like D1, D2, but you don't know what that corresponds with. So you can go ahead and like basically highlight this and just say like outer diameter uh, cylinder or something like that. And then I can set that as just some random number. And then we'll say like inner diameter cylinder. Okay. And then let's do an extrusion. So if I want to do like a cylinder and then cut it out, I want to use the same sketch twice. Um, in order to just make the solid portion of it, I can drop down this selected contours and just click the outer ring, and that's going to give me the solid piece. If I selected like both, it's going to give me a ring. So um, you can also select areas. So you could just select the inner area or the outer area to extrude. Select the edge, and I'm going to make like a, a one inch tall cylinder. And so this also has is a dimension. So you'll see like um, boss extrude one would be like the name of it. And I'm going to make a cut based on the sketch one again. So if I just click sketch one before I do it, then it will kind of pre-select those lines. And I'm going to use this to cut five. So that's going to be cut extrude one, the second feature. And a configuration means that all of those parameters I just put in for the size, I can make like 10 different versions of that with 10 different sizes. And that could be useful if I want all of those variations to just be really organized in one file. And I don't have to CAD 10 individual things and like keep track of all of them and, and try to do that because it becomes really uh, frustrating and complicated when I do that. So it's nice and that it's all stored in an Excel sheet. And so I can just type in numbers for those kind of, if you've ever used a CAD program called OpenSCAD, they have that like a uh, interface where you're just typing in commands to do CAD stuff like the dimensions of circles and how, how far you extrude and that it's a cylinder, etc. So, so if you jump over to this configuration tab, which is the third one over, that's where you're going to put it in. And you can, if you just have like one alternate, you can just add a configuration here. But if I have like many versions, I want to go to insert tables and design table. Okay, and then I'm going to auto create and it's going to pop up this list of those dimensions that I had put into, into my model and it's going to put all of them. And this is why it's important to name them so you know what it represents. So I have outer diameter, inner diameter, how far the cylinder is extruded and how far the cut was made. Once I click OK, those populate as these um, as the headers of these different columns. And now I'm going to create like 
version one here. Double click V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. Okay. And what's also cool is because this is an Excel sheet, I can make equations in each of these cells. So I could have things that are regularly spaced or based on other cells or whatever. So this is the outer diameter. So I'm going to make like an evenly spaced uh, increments of this size. So I'm going to just take equals this cell plus five right and if you know excel you can drag this formula down and now each of those increase by five every version right so it's gonna increase the outer diameter by five it's gonna grow the cylinder this way and let's say the inner diameter is gonna always be like half of that number so equals this cell divided by two i can drag that down I could even change the original one if I wanted to. So maybe I just drag this formula up. Boom, now the original one is changed. So it follows the, the formula. Okay, now this is the, the height of the cylinder. So I'm just gonna put in some random numbers here because that, that one doesn't really matter. Fifty and and then this is the how much is cut out of it. So it just has to be less than that or else it'll be a tube, right? So maybe in the first one, like I'll cut it the whole way through and we'll see what happens. This is also a good, good way to like test the robustness of your model. Like, is it gonna fail at any one of these? It won't tell you up front, but when, once you click on the configuration, you might pop up an error. So it, it can tell you. All right, so I'll just quickly do the rest of these. Five, Okay, so once I've been, once I've done, completed all of the numbers that I want, I'm going to click outside the design table, and it's going to generate all of those and tell me on the screen it's generated version one through five. Hit OK, and now those are populated in this list on the left. And when I double click that list, it's going to change my cylinder. That's the one that I cut all the way through. Right. Double click version two. You see how they're changing now? Each one of those versions was pretty quick to generate. And so in, in real like real life engineering problems, what they're using these files for are like sets of things. So if I had to make like, um, you know, like a, a screwdriver with different heads that fit in it, they're all gonna use the same base um, but the tips are going to change. Maybe it's a flathead, maybe it's a Phillips, maybe it's three things. And so each of, like, that would be a configuration file so you can adapt them all. Um, with Caitlin, we were, we were measuring, like, um, the different size of needles. So, like, needles of different gauges. And then, aside from the pill model that I sent out, I'm going to make a one that's based on those BD needles. So I can have configurations where they're blunt needles or they're beveled needles, needles of all different gauges, um, things like that, different different lengths. So you can imagine, you could get up, up to very high numbers of these versions, but they can all be contained in one file. So I think that uh, can be pretty useful if you need to test a lot of different versions of your design. Okay. So just to show, if you haven't seen the, the pill model uh, file, and I've sent it out to a few people, um, just to go over quickly how it was designed. I created a basically one half of the pill, the larger half. Did a fillet that's based on the radius is, is going to be half of that uh, circle diameter. So it's a full, so it makes a full round on the end. Then I'm going to do a boss extrude two. And what you would notice is two solid bodies popped up. So I unclicked merge result for that one. Then I created a full round on that side as well. Then I did two separate shell operations. And this is the whole reason that they're um, different solid bodies is that so the shell can act on the first cylinder separate from the second cylinder. If I had merged those two solids together, it would just create one shell on the entire interior of those two. And I wanted to just make one pill half and the other pill half. Um, okay, so the configuration is basically you go online and 
you find dimensions that are existing for all of those. And then I had to figure out, based on that table of dimensions for all different pill sizes, how do I make some, how do I make my design table based on those, right? So if I look at under tables, design table, edit feature, no, edit table, you can see in, in this that I've done some math, pop up, right? I haven't named my parameters, but um, you know, if it doesn't self populate into these columns, you can also write something in. Like you could write D2 at boss extrude two if you had to, to, to get that to show up. Um, I think this was the length of the second cylinder. So the only number available online was total length of the pill. So I had to take total length minus like the first cylinder or something to figure out what it was. All right, so all of those were populated and then you can click through the different size pills and it will generate those different sizes. Is there any questions on, uh, you know, making a design table for configuration stuff, right? It's, it's helpful to do this after you've designed the whole model. Um, sometimes configurations can have um, suppressed or unsuppressed features. So say I had like a flat head and a Phillips, right? Flat head might have like just one flat face and a Phillips might have that, but then like patterns so that you get a cross one as well. And so for the flathead, you might have one of those features suppressed in the table. Um, so that's a little more complicated. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna show you a dynamic spring now. And for that, I'm just gonna roll this back. Yes. So a spring is most commonly made um, like this you usually have, you usually make a circle, it doesn't matter what size, and you use that to make a helix. So in features, curves, helix, and spiral. We can create a helix that has like a certain uh, height and number of revolutions, for example, if you know your spring um, 30 and like five revolutions maybe is what the spring looks like. And that's what we call a path because it's defining where the, the spring is going. But then you need like the wire thickness on top of that. So if I figure out where my spring starts and which plane bisects that, right, it's, not, it's not going into a plane right now. So let me go back into here and say the start angle is zero. So you'll see that bisects this plane now. Then I would make a, a circle on another sketch. And I would say that the center point of that circle and the end point of the helix, I don't know, are together somehow. And then I have a profile and a path and I would sweep those. So that's a swept boss base which requires this profile and this path. Okay. So a very dense spring. That's the traditional way to make a spring. When you do a dynamic spring, you have to make it in a different way because this spring has a fixed length. But if we want to make animations, we need to have that length be adjustable, which is confusing, right? Um, so the way we do that is in sketch two, I created a, a circle that's based on my wire diameter, and I can change whatever that is. In sketch three, I've made a vertical line, and I've basically started at the origin and just clicked an endpoint, and I have not dimensioned that vertical line at all. And what you would notice is the end of that line would be blue at that point. Right now it's not because it's defined in an assembly. So I would make sure that the endpoint is not, not defined in position. I just create some vertical line with an arbitrary endpoint, just make sure it's vertical. And then I would do a sweep operation where the sweep is defined by the profile and path like we just did, except the path is not a helix. The path is just the axis that it rotates around. 
And then I need to make sure that I select these types of options. And so those I'll just drag into the screen very quickly because I have them written down. So that would be the options follow path, specify twist value, which is how many revolutions the spring goes around. So that can be found on McMaster. These lists of instructions are actually for if I found a spring on McMaster, how do I use that? Because that's going to already have my dimensions kind of baked into it. But uh, basically go through this to input number of revolutions. Okay, cool. So we did that. We have five revolutions in our spring. Okay, and then um, I just kind of clean it up to make it look nicer. It's like a uh, what they call a closed and ground spring looks like, which is, you know, I add these flat pieces on either side. I generate a reference plane, which is uh, if I if I did reference geometry plane, it would pop that up. And I would define that plane by clicking this line and the endpoint of that line, even though it's not a defined position, the plane will be in reference to that endpoint. It will move with it. And I use that plane to perform a cut operation by sketching a circle, just any circle bigger than my spring on that plane and doing a, a cut through all in the direction that it's going up. So it's cutting off the end and making the end of my spring flat. That can be useful later on in your assembly for mating purposes, where you typically do a concentric and coincident mates. So the circle stays aligned with whatever hole that it's in, and the face of that spring is flat with whatever face it's touching. Okay, and then cut the other side. So there's my spring. The plane helps me figure out also which endpoint was the one that's movable. It doesn't really matter, but when you get into the assembly, you want to know which one you're selecting. Okay, so I made the spring. Then I made a, a base file, right? This is just something that the spring can be touching in the assembly. And I wanted to make something cool, so I made this. Uh, also, this part can be used on both ends of the spring. And I wanted this spring to, like, launch micro needles or launch some needles because that's what we're typically doing, right? We're launching some, something into the tissue. So I have this base. Um, I just used the, the cross-section view to see what it looks like. This was made by a simple sketch of two rings. I define the inner diameter so that it fits the spring. And then I define the offset or the wall thickness. If I was 3D printing, it has to be a certain thickness. Then. I extrude a wall and I mirror that across a plane. And it's using sort of just the bottom of the part as the mirror plane. That's uh, this one. Okay, so I have the base, I have the spring. I made some needles. Where are those? Not that. Here's my needles. Okay, with this one, I made a single needle, which is a revolve sketch. So if I have something with a rotational symmetry, I want to make it like this, where I sketch a sort of half of it and revolve it around some axis. In the revolve, I just select that center axis. Very easy. With this one, I, I made a pattern so I could have many needles. And so with that, I created some reference plane offset by this amount and create an axis, which is another reference geometry made by the intersection of two planes. So I offset the plane and I intersected those two, which gives me this line. And I made a circular pattern where this direction is sort of what it's revolving around or patterning around. And I say, how many you know, needles do I want? And I can just click through the numbers to see how many I can fit. So, so five. Okay. And then I make an assembly. So I make this assembly by first um, dragging in the part that I want fixed, or like usually it's the biggest part. Then insert components 
and just you know keep adding parts to the list, dragging them into the, the assembly view and making mates that align the, the circular parts concentric with each other and the faces that are touching coincident with each other. Uh, and so the, the confusing part of this one is actually tying the the open end of the spring to the other face that the spring is touching. So that's going to be, let's see, this one. No. The spring here, we'll have some mates. Coincident here. Let's let's do one more. Let's do it from scratch so you can see it happen. Okay. I go into the part that I want to make the assembly with, make an assembly. Wait for a second. Okay. Insert the components. Here's my spring. Insert another base. Insert needles. Okay, so this spring I can just click some circular portion as well as this circular portion and meet these concentric. These can still move with respect to each other. So I'm going to click this face and this face, make them coincident. Um, let's see. The needles, I can show the axis, because it's not shown right now. Click the axis and this circle to make those concentric. And the base of the needle with this to make coincident. OK, and so these are the last pieces I have to join. And so the interesting part of this is that I actually right click and edit the sketch in an assembly. And I have to save it, assembly two. So this. This is usually how it comes in, right? It has this blue endpoint. And so I'm going to be clicking this endpoint. Oh, well, first, let's make. Uh, Let's make these co uh, concentric first. So click this and this concentric. OK, now let's join them together. Click that endpoint and click this face. And now those are coincident. All right, so you saw the line adjust. Exit the sketch. Exit editing the component. And now those are tied together. And so what's interesting is if I drag this, and just do this rebuild, it will adjust the height of the spring there. And so we can make this motion steady. I'll just jump over to the one I've, I've made already. And um, can, can I ask, ask her a quick question? Yeah. Um, so if you just ended up using the end of the spring and making it coincident, that one face, that wouldn't be, make it dynamic. You had to edit the sketch to be able to make it dynamic. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so what you're doing is you're taking uh, an undefined part and mating it. And okay. that's, that's the trick. Um, if you take, if you just take the end of the spring itself, um, well, let's, let's try it. Uh, let's see, assembly two. So let's get rid of the last mate we made, which, is, which actually it's not in this list I was looking for it before because it's actually defined in the sketch, right? So if I click the endpoint and I get rid of that, it floats. So let's do that. But because it's not defined in the sketch, then I don't think it will update. Looks like I broke it. <laughs> You have to be very careful about dragging those endpoints. It tends to move really quickly and out of view. OK. Well, 
Let's just undo that. So that's the other thing. I, I basically like dragged the, the end, right, and rebuilt it, and it auto-updated the height of the spring. It turns out if you drag it uh, to be compressed too small and the spring interacts with itself, it'll actually throw an error there. All right, let's get rid of that. Okay. So I won't try to break it again, but I'll just go over to this uh, assembly. Okay, so what I've done here is there's these tabs on the bottom where you can start a motion study. Right. Yeah, let's go to time zero. And so what I've done is um, there's this auto key right here. And you say when it depressed, when it's depressed, it automatically creates a key at the current time bar location for dragged components. And so I basically activate that. You can see it's pressed right now. And then when I go to a certain time point, what I'll do is drag that component up, right? I'll rebuild and it will basically say these components have moved from position A to position B and that position B is going to be at time point two seconds. And then when I hit play, it's going to play the, it's going to basically count, extrapolate what the movement would be from A to B over that time. Okay, and then from two to four, what I've done is I've just dragged the, the needles themselves. I basically suppressed the coincident mate where they were connected to the base and just move, move them a little bit more and rebuild and it creates that time point as well. So I think I have to, to go back and fix the, uh, the spring here that it should be connected. So let's go, let's go into the model and fix that. So that should be on the sweep, sketch three. I can just show the, the sketches. Edit the sketch, and now this should be mated to this surface. I can't even see well. Incident. Okay, great. All right, go back to motion study and um, we'll just play what I was talking about. And plus you get a sweet little sound at the end. How about that? All right. Um, I tried it again. Um, I'm not an expert at this by any means. But you can notice sometimes it's a little bit wonky in how it interpolates between the frames. So you see that it didn't really quite work that time. Um, so just, you know, if you have something to do, then, you know, try to use a good computer to do it. <laughs> so that may be a factor in trying to get it to, to work. Um, but let's try one more time point anyway, just so you can see how it works. So you can depress or select this. You see how it changes the color. I'm gonna go out to 10 seconds, and you'll notice that when I dragged this before, it like spin, it spun a little in the air. That was on purpose, so I should drag it a little bit more and spin it a little bit more. And you'll see how it extended out the time point after I dragged it. Rebuild it again, and we'll let's see if it worked. Yay, it worked. <laughs> So, you know, make a little rocket ship or whatever, and then send it to me, because I would love to see that. <laughs> um, let's see if there was anything else in the, the agenda for today. We did um, some kind of animation. We showed configurations. I'm going to show a move copy body um, intersect, and I think those are the last two things. Um, one thing that is a little bit confusing to, to get around is seeing what features are based on other features, right? And so um, what Soki was mentioning in like the second session we had was that you can actually show which previous ones by right-clicking uh, any of those part files that'll be at the top, uh, the top of any feature tree 
and you can do where was it maybe it's inside a model maybe it's not inside the yeah so there's these two buttons dynamic visualization reference visualization this will be of previous features this will be of features that it is influencing so you can see that my revolve actually uh, my circular pattern is is based on it and so if I go edit the axis or edit the revolve, it may impact if that circular pattern is going to work or not. Um, and so that just means that inside this feature, I've clicked that other feature. I've clicked the axis and I've clicked the revolve. So it's, it's referencing those previous features that I made. Okay. And the other thing was move copy body. I'm going to also show you scale. Sometimes you like, you make something and you, you don't really want to adjust like 20 parameters for dimensions. You just want to say like, make it like 80% the size and just like call it good. So in your commands here, you can always click scale. And then you say, well, what do you want to scale? Maybe just scale one or two of these and about the centroid and like make them half as big. So that's like about their center of mass, they've shrunk. Um, you can, you don't have to choose the centroid, you can choose like the bottom plane or whatever it is so that they stay on the bottom. Then there's a move copy bodies. So that could be useful if I have like one of something, I gotta make a bunch more. So bodies are basically parts that are not connected to anything else. That's how it's defining a body. So like I wanna move this one and then how do you want to move it? Well, I'm going to make this face coincident with this face. Does that work? No. You can do translate and rotate, which is usually what I do. So it'll give you XYZ coordinates. Copy it and say, I want to move it like five millimeters over there. Or I believe you can drag it. Yeah. So now I'm just copying that one and moving it somewhere else. There's also rotate. I don't think you can do them both at the same time. So I would, you know, move the body first and then rotate it. Or you can do like 90 degrees. Oh, and this leads me into intersect. So I have several bodies now that are overlapping and sort of like a the Boolean subtraction type steps that I was showing Sarah before. I may have two bodies that overlap and I just like want to cut the extra off of one of them. There is a feature called intersect and I can select, you know, which bodies do I want to show the intersections click intersect. And now I've got these different regions. I can basically say, get rid of that, get rid of that, or get rid of like the inside where they met. And so, or invert that and get, you know, keep everything else. That could be pretty useful if you're like intersecting stuff and, you know, um, intersecting things where there's like two cylinders coming together and there's like little overhangs that come out of each one as they join. And so you can basically just like trim it with that. You can, you can select many bodies in this, so not just two, but you can have three of them coming together and just, you know, be able to trim off little sections that are strange looking. So, so that's an interesting feature. It's not, not used a whole lot, but can be uh, useful. And then combine. So if I have these six solid bodies now, but maybe I want to do some features in the future that impact all of them, like I want to do a cut that cuts through all of them, I can simplify it by just highlighting all of them, clicking combine, and adding them all together. And I'm not sure why. Well. It's usually not this complicated, so. 
<laughs> you can probably, I think it's because these two are not touching anything, so I can't combine those. So I would just, don't pick scale one or scale two. Or maybe the, just this one. Let's try that. No. Well then, I don't know. All right. <laughs> Do you guys have any um, questions about the stuff I showed you today? No. Hello, Adam. Hi, Nia. Uh, can you just show how did you create that that spring without a helix? Some sort of like you just have a square and you have like an X and you create a spring. That's just kind of like interesting. Um. Can you can you clarify? Yeah. So basically, I would say that there is was one step you basically create the spring, and you can change the length of the spring in a motion wheel. And uh, can you just please repeat? Can you just please repeat how you did it? Sure. So let me go back to how I created the spring in the first place, which is like the helix. That's the key to it. And what you'll notice is after you in the assembly, after you mate the end the not the undefined endpoint, which is blue, to the surface that you wanted to touch, the you'll see this kind of little uh, whatever this this little arrow next to that feature, which says like there's an external reference, meaning that it's referencing a different part entirely. So if I drop that down, then you'll see which sketches is in reference to another part. And if I go in here and I say like this one. Right. This is the one. This is the re specific relation that's referencing a different part. Um, so when I do this spring, uh, typically what I said was you use this uh, profile of the circle, the wire diameter of the spring, and the path is typically a helix. Instead of doing that, I only have the rotation axis of the spring. The spring is coiled around this central axis and the circle. And I do a sweep feature where I just select the path as the vertical line. Oh, I see. And I set these specific parameters. So follow the path, specify the twist value, which is how many revolutions, or in a spring, you'd call it active coils. And then you'd say how many active coils are in there. So if I go over to McMaster and I you know, pick out a spring, um, you know, just choose one of these. Go to product detail. It tells me a bunch of stuff about that spring, in which case you would just you can count these active coils. So there's three, three in this one. You can also use these parts directly if you download that for SolidWorks and load up that compression spring. You can kind of just modify it to be the same as what I showed. I think most most often you want to do that because you don't want to just catch some random spring. You want to catch a spring that you could actually buy off the shelf. Yeah. And so that's what these, um, these instructions that I showed before, this is exactly what the steps you would follow if you, if you did that. If you downloaded the spring, this is what you should do. Gotcha. Yeah. And so there's an error that pops up with some equations because in those springs, uh, Nick Mastercar has some equations in their SolidWorks file that get broken when you delete the spring length, but then you don't really care about those equations. You're gonna kind of redo it anyway. Cool. Adam, I have a question kind of going off of that. So just to clarify, is the dynamism of the spring from how you're creating it, like defining it off of the, um, vertical line or do you need the um, sort of like endpoints that you had when you were doing the launching of the needle in order to make it dynamic? Does that make sense? Say the first part of it again? Um, I guess what I'm, I'm wondering if um, like the creation of a dynamic spring, is it more important like how you actually create the helix shape or in order to make it dynamic, do you also need to like have those two endpoints when you're doing the animation? Yeah, so it's both. It's okay. The first part is having an undefined length in your initial sketch, mm -hmm. right? When you make it. 
And then the second part is mating to the external face that the spring should be touching on the on the undefined end. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, if if you didn't also if you were in here and you didn't define the let's see, go back to here. If you didn't say the spring is coincident with the bottom either on the defined end, then it could also just come off of that base entirely. So you kind of need to fix both ends and then just, just move it how you want. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so you can imagine like I've, I've done this, right? I've just defined that one point, but that, that can be extrapolated to a whole bunch of different um, types of animations where I have, um, for example, I was modeling like Sung Ho's um, implantable device. And for that one, there's like a solenoid spring, right? And that spring is defined off of the moving piece position. And then that moving piece is like pushing on your skin, which is pushing on a button of the device that's inside your body. And so you have, you know, all these relations go together. Um, and I made two dynamic components there. One was the spring compressing as the plunger went down. And the second one was actually some sketch points in the model of the skin because the skin is deforming as well. And so, so you can imagine you can get more complicated with how many pieces are depending on external references there, but you just want to think carefully about how does my how does my system actually interact with its environment to, to make all of those relations? Cool. All right, well, well, that's all that was on the agenda for today. So, and this is the, the last Zoom session. So I appreciate all of you uh, joining me today. I'm glad to have such a a big crowd. I wasn't really expecting a lot of people today. Um, but yeah, I will, I'll send out the link for this recording as well as I'll upload um, all of the videos in the series to YouTube and send you a playlist link. And so you'll have those and, and then you can be experts in solid waste. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks. Adam, thank you so much for putting this together. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Thanks Adam. Thank you Adam.